Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tubless Creek semi-weekly Instagram live broadcast. I am, as always, Jason Haas. Um, we have a really exciting guest this week. Um, I think um, it's, it's Andrea Robinson, who I think is one of the great communicators in wine. I think she has been way ahead of her time um, in kind of bringing wine to everyone, making people feel like it can be theirs. She has a whole list of amazing accolades, um, three-time Beard Award winner, um, Master Sommelier, multi-book published author, um, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and she's continuing to do some really innovative stuff. So I can't wait to talk to her. But while we wait for people to join, as I always do, I want to share a few pictures of what's going on. Um, the big news here is that we are wrapping up with harvest. It's been a warm harvest season, um, alternating between warm and hot. And dirt, that, that means that things have gone fast. So you can see, I'll start with our harvest chalkboard. You can see it's almost full. Um, we're going to be picking this week, and then we're going to be pretty much done. Um, and you might be surprised to know that what is still out there is not like Morvedra or other late harvesting reds. It is instead Roussan, um, which, I mean, that if you know Roussan, that's probably not a surprise. It does always take forever to get ripe. I'll show you a picture of what the, what the grapes look like. Still turning gold, um, looking looking good. Um, and then the other thing, which is still mostly out, another white pick pool, um, fairly late ripening. These are both down in the coldest part of the vineyard also, so that, that's a contributing factor. But uh, whites have their continuum of early to late, as, as do reds. Um, a couple other pictures, just a general overview of what things look like out there. You can see the patchwork. You can see things starting to turn some autumn colors, a little browning. Um, if you look in the right places, there's no Syrah in this picture, but if you did, that would be starting to turn a little bit red. Um, and we have started getting the sheep back in um, a couple of vineyard blocks that we finished picking. So you can see a, a few of them up at the top of that hill in front of the oaks. Um, then in the cellar, we are pressing whites. This is a, a Roussan press load that is in the press right now. Um, we're also pressing reds. This is going to be a really big red press week. That's Austin, one of our one of our harvest interns, cleaning a cleaning a, a, a Morvedra press. Um, so we're going to be pressing all week. There's still a lot of work to be done in the cellar, but the the harvesting piece is is definitely slowing down. Um, one more picture that I liked quite a lot. This is looking up through. This is a Cunois vine. Um, this would have been a view that just a few days ago would have had these plump clusters of grapes right uh, right in front of you. And instead, you got the you got the canes, you got the leaves, you got the trunks, you got the sky. Um, and it happens fast. You go from having grapes everywhere you look to to things being picked in, in what feels like just a few weeks. Okay, um, uh, that's it. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and I'm going to invite Andrea to join. I see her invitation here. And hopefully this will all be as straightforward as it was during our test. Her, uh, her, her request. So um, and then we can dive in together. Hello there. <laughs> Hello, Andrea. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I love those pictures. I'm so stoked about the sheep back in the vineyards too, but it looks absolutely beautiful down there. When do you it think is... you'll harvest that, Rusan? Uh, uh, at this point, there's not a lot of chlorophyll left in those leaves. The gotcha. leaves are pretty yellow. Cool. So there's not a lot that's happening. I, I think we'll probably pick it the end of this week, maybe early next week. Um, there's nothing threatening in the harvest. It's supposed to be like in the 70s to low 80s wow. for the next like week or 10 days. Really? So, so there's not, it's not like, I mean, we, we just finished a week of 105. So like whatever <laughs> has you. happened has happened, but at this point, nothing is going to change very much, but we're a little worried if we leave stuff out too long, right. we'll just end up losing acid. Yeah, for sure. And, and I just, yeah, I love, I actually, when I visited you a few weeks ago, I, I brought home more whites and reds because I love those whites so much. Um, and I'm trying to like dole them out and uh, save at least something for, for Thanksgiving. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's super exciting. And um, I just, just love all those wines and I love everything that you guys are doing on the sustainability front and the soil health front. It's just really inspiring. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so 
there's like a million things I want to talk to you about, but I feel like we should sort of start at the beginning, which, I mean, obviously this isn't the beginning beginning, but I would love you to talk a little bit about your decision to give up a career in investment banking <laughs> to decide to focus on wine. How did, like, that must've felt like an, a, like, like an amazing leap into the unknown. And I'd love to know, I'd love to know what, what was like, what you were thinking as it, as you were making that choice. Yeah. It was a leap, I, and I highly recommend it. Um, I recommend people do it um, early in the in the game, like I did, because I knew that it, the investment banking world is really cool, and I knew that um, that the compensation structures are something that keep a lot of people doing it. And I thought, you know what? I better follow my dream and see if I can make a living in the wine business before I get sort of the golden handcuffs, so to speak. <laughs> But um, it was lucky. I, I had been studying finance and economics in college, so it was a natural, and I was headed to New York, Wall Street. Uh, but then on a lark, I took a wine tasting class at a local restaurant, and I just had that, you know, light bulb moment. Um, they call them in French, I think, the coup de foudre, uh, coup de, coup de foudre or coup de coeur, yeah. where you just like go, ah, oh, you're like, it's a love at first sight kind of feeling. And um, then you get to New York City and you've got the International Wine Center, which is a great wine school, Mary Ewing Mulligan, Master of Wine. You've got, at the time, Kevin Zraeli at the Windows on the World um, Wine School and the top wine cellar in the country. And if you're willing to empty spit buckets and pour wine, set up and clean up, you can take the classes for free. And so once I had that opportunity to actually see what kinds of jobs you could have in the wine industry, I thought, you know, as I'm sort of making my way through the analyst program at the investment bank, I thought, let me try this. And so I actually went to Kevin Zraeli, who is a, still remains a great friend and mentor. And he said, well, if, you, um, if you're gonna do this, First of all, stick with the money, kid, was his advice. But he said, no, I'm just kidding. And I know you won't. Um, you're going to do what you want to do. And he said, you got to go to Europe. And so uh, one, of the, one of the earliest places that I got to um, was, in fact, uh, Chateau de Beaucastel, who oh. are your, um, of course, your partners in, in Tablas Creek. And, um, and why? Because they were one of the wineries in the Wine Experience Grand Tasting Booklet. And he used to uh, produce those events, and they're still great tastings. I'm sure you go from time to time. He handed me the book, and he said, get to every one of these that you can. <laughs> well, you can't get um, – there's no youth hostel, or at least there wasn't at the time, in chateauneuf de pop So I was staying at the youth hostel in Avignon, and I took a bus uh, to chateauneuf de pop and then I walked – uh, from somewhere, a couple of several kilometers, um, finally out to the estate, and uh, and they received me there and took me seriously and um, showed me around and let me taste a bunch of stuff, and um, yeah. So I I guess why I tell that anecdote is just to say that so much about what is uh, really compelling about this industry is the people and how they are so willing to share. Um, whether you're uh, simply a visitor to wine country and who's never going to change jobs, or you're somebody that, like me, who was a nobody but was really, really driven, uh, they are going to share and welcome you and uh, and make you part of this wonderful wine family. So there you go. Um, it sounds like an amazing experience. Having done a fair amount of walking around the Southern Rhone, that is not an easy trek. No. Like you're crossing... <laughs> Highways, your <laughs> yes, like, I was, is... <laughs> <laughs> and I think one of them uh, actually saw me on the road, not knowing you know it was me, and I was the person with the appointment in thirty-five minutes or whatever. And they said, "Was that you out there walking?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Yeah." And they're like, "This is crazy." So somebody drove me back and back to town after it was done. They're like, "No, not happening. Uh, we're, we're taking you back in a car." So anyway, but amazing. Yeah. Uh, so you ended up. You ended up a, a part of the the sommelier team at Windows on the World. Um, yeah, I mean that. I feel like that was like the the incredible incubator for wine talent at the time. Can you can you talk a yes. little bit about Windows for yeah. people who maybe don't don't know it? And um, that whole complex opened in 1976, a pretty momentous year for wine in in America with the Paris tasting. Um, and just coincidentally, um, that was the year that that restaurant opened under the very famous restaurateur, Joe Baum, who also had the Rainbow Room. And he started the Four Seasons restaurant in the old, what we called the Seagram building at the time at Park Avenue. And uh, still there, still cranking, still the power lunch place. 
Um, but anyway, uh, his his um, charge to Kevin Israeli was, um, you need to create the greatest wine list in the city, maybe even in the country. And um, and so that was the goal. And originally, Lower Manhattan was not a place where people went and hung out after work. Um, it cleared out as quickly as the trading floors shut down. It was almost a ghost town. So part of the objective was to have something really compelling. ride and it was it was a wine list of course it was a view like no other we looked down on the traffic helicopters going by they were flying lower than us um but it was that wine program because the it was both super extensive i think maybe and it got maxed out but also really great prices and so that really dr drove people to go there because we had we weren't taking huge markups as a way of building traffic. And then he started the wine school. And, you know, you've got all these masters of the universe and heavy hitters, and they like, they want to know more, right? Because anybody that's really sort of type A always kind of wants to know the backstory and more details. And and so they started coming to the to uh, the wine classes. And it was one of those crazy things where it was, you know, people were paying tuition to become better better customers of the restaurant, <laughs> which <laughs> is great. <laughs> and it's kind of like people visiting tasting rooms, right? You know, they show up and they, you know, uh, book a tasting at, at, at Tablas Creek. And it's such a magical environment. If you haven't been there, you must go. Um, but it's like they and then and then you have an educator taking them through the wines and and they enthusiastic customers of your product. So it's pretty darn cool. Yeah, it's uh, like just the list of people who have come through that that Windows of the World program is, yeah. is incredible. Um, um, so Jillian Balance, a fellow master sommelier, Catherine Fallis, another yeah. fellow ma master sommelier. And if you weren't catching the names, they're both females. So three female master sommeliers under Kevin Israeli, right? That's that's a guy that's got uh, got vision and um, a very inclusive and sharing attitude. So, and that's and that's just three of us. There's a, a star-studded yeah. list of people in that family tree. To your point, and it, I mean, at that time, there were how many? How many women were master psalms at that time? Twenty, maybe. Like, so you're at talking about fifteen percent no, of the world's total at population. That time it, yeah, at that time, I think it was about six. And oh, then, so and, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we're, but we're cranking, we're going, we're going yep. forward and, and the court is doing some amazing things with a women's symposium and other initiatives, um, both for, for, for lots of underrepresented populations yeah. that are within the sommelier field. So I'm very excited about that. And, um, and it's working more and more people um, that are not maybe the typical profile of a, a, a wine expert are, are jumping in and bringing so much energy and uh, perspective and um, yeah, excitement to the field. Um, so I, I wanted to ask about that. It, was there, like what, what drove you to, to become, uh, to, to follow that Master Psalm path, to become a part of the court? You know, it's very, very interesting because I never even thought when I was gonna join the wine business that I would even go into restaurants. I never thought I would be that person that would want to be on the floor. And then, um, but once I started serving uh, wine at the wine school and being around that environment and seeing the wine cellar workings, I was like, it was like a, a little bit of a mini theatrical production every night and you never quite knew what would happen. Um, and all the, all the characters were new faces walking through the door. And that just was super exciting to me. So, um, so I went that route because of doing that uh, that class and being exposed to what the restaurant industry was, which was this, I think it's one of the most important, other than consumers who are what we call the depletions experts of wine, they're the most important piece of the of the wine industry. But I think that, um, that other than the people who make it, I think that that sommelier role, that um, that server who knows the wine program role is such a big deal because I feel like we are the the bridge between the artisan farmer and grower, wherever they are in the world, toiling away, you know, tucking their plants in, in at night and singing them lullabies. I mean, really, really 
committed to our planet and to a great, great quality product, we're the bridge between that person and their hard work with the person who can appreciate it. And that's a really intimate and very special, uh, highly honor, honorary, honorary role to have. Like I feel very lucky to have to play that part. So um, that's why I went that route. I felt like it was just really a privilege. So I, I'm curious, I mean, one of the things that I, I think I've said in a couple of places as as I was encouraging people to watch this conversation was that one of the things that you are, you are, I think, particularly great at is making people feel like wine can be for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's something that we need as a community, like more than ever now. Yeah. And I'm wondering, was there a point where you realized like, like, I'm good at this. Like, I, I, I can, I can play, I can play a meaningful role in this. I'm just, but like, when, when did, did that? Was that a moment, or was that gradual? Or, I think it was. I think it was gradual um, because I first was a, a student of how other people did it well, and with Kevin Israeli being one of the great ones. But there, are, you know, I'll, I'll never forget a tasting that I poured for with uh, with Remy Krug from Krug Champagne. And you, everyone knows that like Krug Champagne is the, you know, the sommeliers like, like last supper type, type of wine. Um, I remember just how impassioned he was and how he made it really okay for people who had no idea how the bubbles got in the bottle, as well as people who have had every vintage of cave collection they ever made, all feel included and a part of it because he somehow is able to make the rudimentary information um, like accessible and like, a, why would you know that? I don't, I don't speak Farsi, but you know, tell me more kind of thing. I mean, it some, everything is its own language, but also making the person who knew a lot feel a little smarter. So like everyone in the room's happy. So I thought that's the magic, that's the secret sauce. And I had, a, I had to really pay attention to the people that did that well. And, um, and I think it's something that built up over time. And it, it ties into the title of the of the, the 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 kind of book that you published, which is "Great Wine Made right. Simple." Like, I mean, that's a yeah, that's a great way, I think, of of just wrapping your arms around this mm -hmm. idea that you don't need to you don't need to make you don't need to choose between talking to experts right. or talking to novices. Not at there's all. there's a way to do it that makes everybody feel welcome. 100%. And it's really important. I think it's nobody like you don't go up to a group of three dentists and go, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about teeth. <laughs> um, you know, but people do that about wine. It's like, you know, why, have, why we've kind of rarefied it so much. Um, but I think that that's changing a lot. I think it really is. And I love the way that tools like this, like Instagram and, and other aspects of connectivity that, um, that the internet has brought us give voice to so many people so that it can that the conversations can take all their own character and flair and and include a lot more people it's really great and i think one of the things that i i've wondered a lot about is why when food has had so much much success on tv mm -hmm. why wine and it's not just wine i mean drinks in general have struggled yeah. to to find their place on tv and i think you've done some of the most successful things on TV in the world of wine. And I'm curious if you've thought about like why, what it is about wine that makes it difficult to translate to TV or how, like how we might do this better as a community. I know you're working on a, you're working on a video project now that I'm going to ask you about in like seven minutes, but yeah, um, like bigger picture, bigger picture. What are your thoughts about kind of drinks and specifically wine and the television format? Yeah, I, that's a great question. And Emeril Lagasse, I, I was on his, his show a couple times, and he told me, because um, uh, I got there, and we were, I think the, the thing we were going to talk about is he, he's hugely passionate about Pinot Noir, and I think that was kind of the, the wine theme of the show. And uh, they had this whole tableau of, like, cherries and blood oranges cut in half and cranberries and this beautiful, like, tablescape um, of of essences that would that you get out of a pinot noir and grenache for that matter almost they're they're very similar in style i think with i throw a little more pomegranate into the grenache realm but um because it's got a little bit of a spicy zesty thing but he said i said that's so cool he's like yeah red wine just looks like red wine on tv so we had we have to make this visual whereas like when he's making 
you know, chicken versus shrimp on blackened versus poached, it, there's a lot more visually to follow, yeah. right? And that's why in the, the shows that I did, um, like Simply Wine was really the one that I think people resonated with so much. Um, so much of it was on location because for sure, the visuals, I mean, yeah. look where you are right now. Uh, the visuals of, of restaurants are sexy. The visuals of vineyards and vineyard regions and uh, all of that are beautiful. So I think that's the biggest translation. And that's why the other, to your point about food, one of the things we did so much was pair the pair food with whatever it was and really talk about that. Because everybody eats, you know, I'll, I'll call it three squares a day, whatever your, your you know, <laughs> particular consumption patterns are, but everyone eats and not everybody consumes wine. And so we were always trying to make sure that they had the tools to bring that because the thing I learned when I visited France, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to agree with this, is that, you know, I, I grew up with like you'd put salt and pepper shakers on the table. It was very su southern like tradition household. And in fact, you put one set on each end of the table so that people didn't have to reach or pass. Um, but the, the final condiment on the French table and the European table, but especially French, is is the wine. And that's because it has the acid that launches fla the flavors of food. And people are always like, why, why are they natural partners? It's the acid, right? Open your fridge right now. Every condiment in there has either salt or acid or both. And um, once I sort of, you know, figured that out um, and then making it visual for television, you've got to have the personalities, uh, you've got to have the beautiful food, then the beautiful places. Um, and then all the other stuff, there's a lot of cool stuff that's visual. The corks are neat. People don't understand exactly that stuff. So, uh, the dirt is cool. You know, the number of times I've like either licked a rock or at least <laughs> picked it up and had somebody, you know, bust it in half and make me smell it. That's cool. You know, then, then I think those are visual things, but, uh, it's a lot, there's a lot less, uh, you have to work a little harder for the visual on wine in a television medium. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it ties in also to the idea, I don't know how tightly connected this is, but the idea, like everybody feels confident saying whether or not they like a particular food. Like they feel confident in their ability to yeah. say, oh, I like this flavor, I don't like that flavor. And yet right. you put a wine in front of most people and they freeze as though like yeah. they're afraid to even evaluate their own opinions. Yes. Um, and, and have have it like well, if I say I like it, will 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 the other ex the experts around think I am cl classless and clueless because I'm not supposed to? <laughs> you know, if it's X Y Z wine taste, I think that's right. There is that intimidation, and you're right. People will say, you know, I really hate capers, or you know, I, I hate truffles. I'm like more for me. Um, but with wine, it's true. I think unless people have gotten to this point of uh, of of confidence generally in in their own palate and that it's okay to like what they like yeah. there is that uh, wor worry about being judged especially if it's inexpensive you know people think like it's supposed to be expensive to be good and that's just not true yeah and i think i remember you reading an interview with you where you said something like like there is a place for expensive wine there is a place for inexpensive wine Absolutely. in the same way that it there is, is there's the place for the whatever three dollar taco that you can get at the at the a little taqueria in town in the same way that there's a place for a fine dining sort of experience. hundred percent. Absolutely. And you're going to relish both of them equally, but in different ways. And that's, that's, you know, gosh, that's what really makes life kind of worth living. Like you wake up and you, those are the kinds of things that, um, that, you know, little, little sources of pleasure. And it's, we need, we need that. And I, I think one of the things that, that I know I try to do when I'm, particularly have a group of a kind of newer consumers in front of me is just give them conf give them a little bit of vocabulary and a little bit of confidence to use it do you like things generally that are sweeter or earthier do you like things right. generally that are more tannin or more fruit do mm -hmm. you like things that are brighter in acid or do you like things that are softer like just those sorts of descriptors that they can use when they're at a restaurant yeah. and be like, okay, these are kind of the wines that I like. And that's enough for a, for a professional on the floor to be like, okay, good. I know where to direct you. Absolutely. And I'm going to give you one add to that, um, which is to go ahead and be confident in your budget. Yes. 
if you're in a place where they make you feel bad because you don't want to get the wine that's double the price of your most expensive main in your on your table yep. then you're in the wrong place yep. <laughs> because and the great sommeliers will if you say okay we we're looking for something like this or i like this kind of thing and i don't want to spend more than 50 dollars or you know forty dollars or whatever the number is depending where you are it's maybe a little tough in a big city and like a fancy steakhouse to hit the fifty dollar price point but say it and if you can't because you're with the in-laws to be maybe or the boss or somebody that you are not quite in sync just yet with point to the point to a, uh, the, that price on the list and say i usually drink this kind of wine but i'm what do you think about that and just point to the price and then they'll get the sense of where you're at on on your number and if they're if they're good at what they do they'll be like oh i love that but if you mentioned you like acidity let me point to suggest this one and if they are not staying within that price point then you know that'll be the last time you dine there because they're not respecting your budget i, I mean every every sommelier who i know like relishes yes finding these gems that are inexpensive yes. and special and yeah. like watch, they're probably more the excited face. yeah like more excited to share that than they are the whatever three hundred dollar trophy that everybody already knows they, the name exactly they, they they that's when their then their true palette and their their treasure hunter uh instinct kicks in and they get to do something to to turn you on to something that they found and yeah there it is that's the most exciting moment is when somebody <laughs> says I really don't want to spend more than 40 dollars and i love blah blah blahs and you go oh i have your thing <laughs> hold on i'll be right back and like that's just fun times all around <laughs> awesome okay um so can you talk a little bit about your new project quench which i believe is launching a week from today yes <laughs> yes i can <laughs> um and you know it's gonna the first episode is gonna take place right here but i promise i will have proper lighting <laughs> um today was not the day for that i'm tasting a bunch of wines for the airline so the kitchen is a little bit a little bit uh um shambly right now but yes it's a show called quench um it's gonna live stream on my facebook page and my youtube channel um and it's really um about all beverage but with a heavy focus on wine um i live in here in the napa valley i live in wine country since 2004 so it's very much home and um i my appreciation for uh the growers and the producers is just you know it's greater than it ever would have been if i hadn't uh, been able to move to wine country and raise my children here um but uh the each 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 show and we'll start out with a monthly uh, frequency and we'll see how we do. But each show is going to have a taste along segment. Uh, we'll talk quite a bit about sustainability because it's something that I'm really passionate about. And I think beyond the words like organic, people don't really have a, a real clear picture of all the ways that we can vote with our wallets and with our our um, intentionality and in, in, in selecting. Um, to uh, to help out the planet, but also people and communities that are associated with those wines. Because years ago, it's at least 20 years now, the, the concept of the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profits was created. Now more than ever, right? It's a, it's a, a huge aspect of, of corporate responsibility. So we'll focus on sustainability. It's not hard. It's kind of cool. Like sheep is part of it. Like just, uh, you know, right? That's as an example. Um, and, uh, and that really is a whole nother way for us to connect to and relate to the topic. We'll also have a pairing segment every time. I'm going to actually include a cooking demo in this first one. Um, I did uh, what we call in the TV trade a stand and stir show uh, years ago called pairings with Andrea. Um, so, you, you know, you cooked a menu and you paired wines with it. Um, but people really, really value the ability, like an, a call to action, an immediate takeaway. Whoa, I can go do that. So it'll be simple stuff, delicious stuff. In fact, the first one is um, the the ultimate pairing for Napa Valley Cabernet because I'm starting out with Napa here and it is a vegetarian dish. So, so you have to tune in to see what it is. Um, but this is a, a total winner and uh, it will make all of your your pairing life much, much easier. Um, and we'll always have some special guests. So one of my guests, the first episode is called Next Gen Napa because I want people to see that uh, a lot of new generation um, family members are taking over or 
playing bigger and bigger roles in their family wineries. It's still a heavily family owned winery uh, valley and uh, I'm super proud of that because when you live amongst your vines yep. and you live in that community for a long time, it just, it really, it really affects the ethos of how you operate. So, and sustainability is a big part of it. So we've got, you know, I'm gonna be doing, uh, the taste along segment is called the big six grapes, right? So that's Riesling, Sauv and Chard, Pinot, Cab and Syrah, because if you know those sort of classic noble French grapes, you already know a whole bunch about the wine list and the wine world. They've traveled far and wide, um, ergo the, the Syrah at, um, at Tablas and it's uh, sister and brother grape varieties from that beautiful Rhone region. Um, but those are, it's kind of like if you know chicken and beef and uh, chocolate and vanilla, you know, respectively on the restaurant menu or on the ice cream flavor thing, you, you have your baseline, right? So these are the baseline grapes and they're next gen versions of them um, that I'm excited about every, you know, little things like sustainability, like no capsule, it's just a piece of trash. If you're gonna have a cork, you don't have to necessarily have a capsule because it's just gonna be thrown out. Um, lighter bottles, you guys are like the masters of that. I know you've saved so much carbon plus so much money and probably so much back pain and so much hassle if it doesn't fit in my <laughs> wine rack like there's a million good reasons to to do to make intentional choices like that so we'll do that and then i'm also going to be welcoming to to congratulate the most recent uh new master sommelier miles trap who's a a local and living proof along with myself and some others that you can do that exam uh with a toddler you can succeed <laughs> Uh, but it does take a lot of a lot of support and a network and uh, as does just life in general and boy goodness sakes if we don't uh, both uh, cultivate our relationships and have gratitude for them then we're gonna have some trouble yeah um so we, we reconnected recently when you were down here working on a documentary yes um, is that something that you can you can share, or is that still a secret? It is. It is. Um, I it's I, I have sort of a working title for it, so that part maybe I'll I'll leave off. But um, but it's a documentary for 2026, which many people th know is the 50th anniversary of the Paris tasting. That right. in one in uh, that one slice of which was to help put California on the map of fine wine, and then many other regions to follow. But it's also the 250th anniversary of the signing of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, the bicentennial for which in 1976 was the original inspiration for the tasting. It was just going to be California wines. Patricia Gallagher, Stephen Spurrier's partner, was kind of tired of the fact that there were only sort of bulk, bulk California wines right. in even the finest of Paris shops. And she said, we need to bring over some good ones and introduce them to our French colleagues. Uh, lo and behold, through a, you know, big bunch of luck, they got there and suitcases of people like Margaret Mondavi and Louis Martini Jr. and Andre Chelichev, who is our guru of, uh, of wine. Um, and so this documentary is not about that tasting and the results of that tasting, because on any given day, uh, world class wines, the pecking order is going to change. You know, they, they are all they were all spectacular quality and remain so. However, what that served as was really as a tipping point for upstart regions to see that they could do something if they committed to it. Um, everybody leveraging the French know-how that was already here in California with people like Andre Chelichev, who had taught both Warren Winyarski and Mike Gergich, who made the winning wines for that particular time, um, and the spirit of sharing and learning together, making mistakes together, um, and then really opening up wine country to visitation. That was a big Robert Mondavi thing, like, you know, hey, come see what we do. Yep. And now it happens all over the world. So, so this documentary will kind of celebrate what came from that in 50 years time, which is some of those things that I mentioned, but also the United States of America became the, the top wine market on the planet. And what that said was, we do know, love, and uh, will will travel for, will pay for quality wine and to know more about it. And it's, it's just the, the radical change of that and the way it's such a beautifully melded, connected network of people and farmers, sommeliers, wine lovers, travelers uh, all over the world is something that I think 
the more we can celebrate that, the better off we all are. So that's what it's about. So oh, cool. Cannot wait to watch it. I know. Well, you're going to be in it, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that part. I don't really want to watch that part, okay. but I want to watch all the other all right. parts. Okay. Uh, well, you can, you can go make, make some popcorn during that right. section, so. <laughs> uh, okay. I have one more real question. Um, yeah. and, and again, like I could absolutely just hang out and talk with you all afternoon. And it, would be, it would be a huge pleasure. Likewise. But, um, so I'm sure you've thought about what like kind of wine as a community needs to do to continue to grow and to continue to stay relevant and connect with the next generations. Yep. And I'm curious, I'm curious if you have, have any like big picture recommendations or thoughts or uh, things that things that are, are worth sharing. Yeah, I, I think so. I, um, my, my number one thing is really, um, is really stoking the natural curiosity that we all have and really listening for and celebrating and not just waiting for them to finish their sentence so you can put your opinion in all these different perspectives um and a, a concrete example i'll give you is just how much uh even the most classical wine regions um, of europe and other places have opened up the mind around what you can pair it with um, because, and I'll never forget this, it's probably been 15 years ago, but Aline Bali, whose family, she's American, but French American, her family owns a famous Sauterne, um, a state called Chateau Coutet. Sauterne is a beautiful, unctuous dessert. We call it a dessert wine. I just got told yesterday by another great sommelier, er uh, Eric Siegelbaum, don't call it dessert wine, <laughs> call it sweet wine. The primary reason not to call it dessert wine, she was pairing it with Thanksgiving turkey because she's American. She makes Sauterne and like, it's fantastic. And so opening up blinders to what to pair things with, I think now, you know, anybody in, in Bordeaux is more than happy to have their wine served with that $3 taco, you know, and it's so fun, right? And now that we travel, um, we, we do that. And so um, opening things up, thinking about like, if, am I making a BLT? Yes, you can have bubbles and BLT, you know, for example. Um, and it's not just this rarefied thing. And then the other thing that I think we've really done a good job with, um, but we need to do more, is the just reminding people that it doesn't have to be expensive to be good and the traditional trappings aren't required for the product to be good. So, for example, I still have a little bit more of it in my fridge. You can put wine such as uh, rosé from, from Tablas in a box and you have immediate, uh, like, you know, practicalities that come from that and convenience elements that come from that. And so being open to, um, alternative packages and alternative like consumption occasions, I think that's a super, uh, it's a, all kinds of areas where that trend is growing. And I think it needs to continue. Um, I'm kind of personally excited about, um, I work with Delta Airlines. I'm personally excited about the, they become the official airline of the WNBA. And I'm kind of a fan of those lady hoops players. And I just like that where that's going. And they have a partnership with a great Sonoma County winery, La Crema. Like it's cool when you can sync up people's other areas of passion or interest with that additional commonality. Hey, we both love, you know, I remember doing an event many years ago at Blackberry Farm, which is an amazing Relay Chateau resort. Well, like the the manager, the manager of the Dodgers was there. He's like really into wine and, you know, it was of course the off season. Um, we have so much in common with each other and you can really have a much better uh, and more connected conversation if you have a glass of wine and while you're doing that. So, so those are some of the ways that I think uh, we're, we're, we're on the right path and we just need to keep on, keep on down it. Awesome. I love it. I think that's a terrific thing to, <laughs> to wrap the conversation on. Uh, awesome. What, if people want to follow you, learn more about your projects, what is the best way for them to do that? So andreawine.com is the website. Um, I think there's a link in my bio to that. There's also a link in my bio to the watch page for the first episode of Quench. So you'll be able to see exactly where it is and subscribe. And I think it sends a reminder. 
um, uh, right before the show. And we will always, I'll, I will have the recordings as well. So if you miss it live, you can still do it and, uh, or you see it and then you say, I want to do that tasting, get your friends together, get, you know, 12 people or 15 people and get the six wines and taste them. And you can follow along that way. Um, but all the links in the bio to the website and to the show page. Um, and of course, if, if you fly Delta, you'll see my wine selections on there from time to time. Um, and, uh, and if you come to wine country, you better look, look us up, whether it's, uh, the beautiful Paso Robles, we don't, we don't have any limestone up here much, but, uh, <laughs> but we have some, some nice, uh, hillsides and, and some beautiful, uh, ocean breezes like you guys do. So it's cool. Awesome. Well, Andrea Robinson, thank you so much for taking a chunk out of your Wednesday afternoon thank you. To, to share your story and the cool stuff you're working on. Um, like I said at the beginning, I'm a huge, huge fan, huge admirer. I think Likewise. that the, the things that you do are so needed right now in, in the world of wine. And I just love that the, that message that wine is for everybody is, uh, is, is, is so true. So well, again, and the things that you do are very much needed in the world of wine as well. Taking care of, taking care of the planet and making it easier for people is, uh, it's what it's, it's what we got to do. So thank you for your leadership on that. My honor, my pleasure. Excellent. All right. Cheers thank you, everybody. You. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everybody who joined. Um, I will be back in a couple of weeks. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.